Hi, I'm Ho Bellinson and welcome to pictureframes.co.uk where over a series of videos we're going to give a complete course on the subject of water gilding. So water gilding is the traditional method of applying gold leaf or other precious metal leaves to bare timber surfaces using all water-based materials and in such a way that a very bright burnished gold and this rubbed through effect can be achieved. Water gilded frames are amongst the top end of picture frames that um, you can buy and what we hope is that having done this course um, you'll be able to buy plain timber frames hopefully from our website and then using these techniques and materials turn them in to the water gilded frames yourself. But also broken down into the sections you'll be learning how to gesso and how to use other washes and techniques which individually you can produce a range of finishes with. So for example this sample here is produced just by gessoing the frame and then putting an antique wash on it. These distressed frames are produced by using a combination of gesso and paint. And then we have the actual water gilded frames where this one's quite distressed showing a bowl colour through and with the leaf lays showing. And here we're using gold leaf but that's using white gold and here we have one using Kaplan which is a very expensive leaf similar to platinum but all using the same range of techniques to achieve them. The whole course is going to be about 40 videos long and during that time we'll be telling you where to buy the materials from and how to do absolutely everything in a step-by-step -step fashion. Okay, what we're going to do now is make our rabbit skin glue size. And we need some rabbit skin glue, and there's the crystals. They look a bit like Demerara sugar. And we're going to mix that eight parts water to one part crystals. And we're gonna leave those to soak in a saucepan and ideally overnight, but certainly for a few hours. So take the one part of crystals, eight parts of water, in the pan, and put a cloth over it to stop any dust or anything getting into it, and also to help stop it evaporating. And we're now gonna leave that overnight. Okay, so we come back the next day, and you can see that uh, the crystals have absorbed most or even all of the water and formed a sort of jelly-like mass there. And what we're going to do now is we're going to warm that up. Now, here I have a cooker, which is a little hob, which is very controllable and I can set to a very, very low temperature. And I only ever go as far as two on here uh, because we never want to get this mixture hotter than a really hot bath. And the reason is because if it evaporates, if a lot of the water evaporates off it, it'll change the strength of the glue and that can cause us problems. So if you don't have access to something like this, then what you could do is make a bain-marie, which is basically just putting your container inside another container which is full of hot water and you could control the heat much better like that if you wanted. So um, now as I do this I'm going to stir constantly and let me introduce you to the kind of brush we use for this which is called a, a string bound fitch and a fitch is that style of brush but the string bound bit is extra important because we're going to be putting these in so much water and everything that the metal ferrules on a lot of brushes tend to give out after a fairly short time. So we use these brushes for gesso. So constantly stirring that as we warm it up and then 
after a while we're going to get a nice clear mix. Right, so now that's warmed up nicely and remember no hotter than a hot bath um, so that's okay and if you just feel it you shouldn't have any um, lumps or anything left or granules left it should be completely smooth and in fact you'll find it's quite sticky um, when you feel the consistency of it. So now we're going to take that and here I've got the frame which I've prepared, given it a nice sand, make sure there's absolutely no glue or anything on the surface um, from joining the frame and well prepared to put the size on. And we're going to give it a neat coat of the rabbit skin glue size, making sure that I work it into all the nooks and crannies in the frames and get right in inside the sight edge there, all over the face of the moulding and right over the back of the moulding there. So it's all covered nicely. And again, using the string bound fitch, I'm working it in as much as I can into the grain of the wood. Now what this is doing is it's forming a base for our gesso. So we're actually working the glue right into the grain of the wood so that the subsequent layers will have a key to stick to. So not a lot more to say on. on that. Now this will take about two hours to dry. So after we've done this coat, we're going to do a second slightly different coat um, but it will take at least two hours and this needs to be thoroughly dry before applying the second coat. Right, so there's the first neat coat of the rabbit skin glue size and we'll now wait for that to dry. Right, so now the first coat is completely dry so I've given the glue a bit of a warm up again, remember no warmer than a, than a hot bath. And at this stage, I'm going to put some of that aside and quite a reasonable amount. Um, not probably a bit too much, actually. Not that much. Um, and we'll need that for various tasks later on in the process. Now this, because we might not come back to it for a few days, um, I put in the fridge because um, it is an organic thing. So it'll prolong its life if you, if you keep it in the fridge. So I'll put that in the fridge in a bit. Now the second coat of primer, we're just going to put a little bit of Gilder's whiting in there. Now this is what we're going to use to make gesso and it's calcium carbonate chalk, but it's also called French chalk or Gilder's whiting. And there it is, very, very fine chalk powder. So I'm going to put about a heat tablespoonful in my mix now, in what's left of my, my rabbit skin glue mix there. Uh, it's a fairly rough amount, but the way I think of it is, the first coat of glue, if we go back to the frame, the first coat of glue was just the pure glue to soak right into the grain. And now we're gluing a few particles um, of the chalk to the surface, which will key the surface ready to receive the gesso, which is a, a much thicker, um, preparation. So give that a good stir, sort of figure eight pattern there, making sure it's all in there, we don't want any lumps or anything. And then we're going to prime the frame with the second coat. That by the way is called sizey white, sizey white at this stage. And um, there we go, slot that on. And again making sure there's always three sides of a picture frame to paint the inside of the sight edge there, the face there, and the back. And again, get it into all the nooks and crannies. We can be quite liberal with it, but uh, we don't want too much excess floating around. And there we go.
Okay, so working it all into every little thing. Then when I finish this, I'm going to leave this overnight to dry uh, because it wants to be completely dry. Um, and then tomorrow we can put the gesso on here. Now that's that finished. Now again, my sizey white can go in the fridge um, where it'll keep nicely for, um, for use later on. Okay, so we brought um, the mix back now to the hot bath temperature and in the saucepan. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure out um, half a litre 500 milliliters, here we go, 500 milliliters of the sizey white into my saucepan. And I'm also going to measure out 600 milliliters, 600 milliliters of the Gilders whiting, the French chalk, and I'm going to pour that quite gently because the more sloshing and so forth we do, the more bubbles we're going to create in the mix. So I'm going to pour that into my sizey white. So remember that was a mix of five parts of sizey white and six parts of Gilder's whiting. And now I'm going to introduce a brush, which I've already wetted in the sizey white. So again, we're not introducing air into the mix. And gradually I'm going to start to stir that using a figure of eight pattern. I'm trying to stir all of the Gilders whiting in to make a smooth, smooth gesso. Okay, so you can see we've got quite a dense texture. Um, those big air bubbles on the top should, they will go in the next part of the process which is the filtering. So, but we do everything we can to avoid getting lots of small air bubbles in there. And gradually I'm stirring till I reckon I've got rid of all the lumps of Gilder's whiting. So now I'm going to find, get another pan and I've got a sieve here and a piece of muslin and I'm going to pour the mix through the muslin and as I come down into the pan I can see I've still got some lumps so I can do a bit more stirring So once we've got everything into the, the muslin there, um, we can just work it through, just sort of stirring it through. Okay, all our used bits and pieces, we're going to wash with some uh, warm water. And what we're left with here is a nice smooth paste or um, gesso the consistency of double cream and throughout the whole process we've kept it at the warm bath temperature now at this stage I wanted to show you this is a, a proper bain marie and you see it has a jacket of warm water there which and a cast iron pot so we could work with this and it will keep the, uh, the gesso warm for a good long period and we can decant off into that. But generally speaking, because I've got my very controllable cooker and I've got quite a large volume of it in the pan, this will stay warm enough for us to work. But we have to be very aware not to evaporate 
any of the liquid off uh, because we don't want our mix to change strength throughout the process. Okay, so now we're going to put at least four coats of the gesso onto our frame and the first coat we work in so that we're really trying to get it in again to the grain and remembering to get all three sides that we need to coat and really working it in to every nook and cranny. I'm not forgetting the back of the frame, side of the frame if you like, and not forgetting the side edge of the frame there. So first coat, work it in, making sure that it gets in every little ridge and every little cranny at the front. Each time I go into my pan, I'm just giving it a very gentle stir and I'm not allowing the brush to drip into the pan, I'm just pulling off the excess up the side of the pan there. Again, trying to avoid getting too many air bubbles in the mix. Now the second and subsequent coats, they go on while the gesso is still wet, but after it has dried to a sort of first stage, what I would call flashed off, whereas it's dried on the surface, but not right through. And you can see that because where it's completely wet, it's still very glossy and shiny. Um, but in some parts now, it's gone matte and a duller colour. And that's the right time when it's gone that matte, duller colour. Um, that's the right time to put the next coat on. If it goes completely bright crystal white, then it's a bit too dry. And if it goes completely like that, you'll, it's a good idea just to spray back some water on it. Um, the idea is that all of the coats will weld together to become come one so it's really a sort of wet on wet process okay so now I'm putting on the second coat and whereas we worked the first coat in the second coat and subsequent coats we want to be careful not to disturb the coats underneath so I'm simply laying the gesso on quite carefully only using the brush in one direction just laying the coat on, perhaps drawing it out a little bit um, so I don't get too much on and don't pull it and let it run and so forth but um, as I said careful not to disturb the coats underneath and these subsequent coats take less time to dry than the first coat. So we've got to be fairly on our toes about um, putting these coats on. And often with a bigger frame, you're just going straight round and round um, because by the time you get round the frame, it's ready for the next coat. And as I said before, we're gonna go round at least four times, at least four coats. Okay, just a word at this stage about some of the possibilities. Um, you can actually spray gesso, and it's a brilliant technique if you've got the facility to do so. Now, for doing that, I use one of these old Devilbus JGA guns 
uh, suction gun. And the reason I use that is it's got a metal part. And if I'm working over a period, I can stand that pot in some warm water to keep everything nice and, um, nice and warm. So I'm going to pour some of our mix into my pot now. And move over to the frame. And obviously we want the proper extraction and everything, so put some fan on there. Now, on this frame, I've already brushed in the first coat, and that's to make sure we work in a good base layer. But the advantage now is that with my spraying, I can get the next two coats on very quickly, and they will be better quality, so there'll be less sanding to do later. So, get a nice spray consistency. You can see rather a lot quicker than putting on my hand and at the end of the day I'm going to be achieving a result which takes less work to get to the perfect finish that we're looking for. So with the spraying, uh, a coat by hand, first coat, two coats by spray, so I'll leave that till it goes the dull colour then put another coat on, and possibly a final coat by hand, um, uh, depending upon the build required. Okay, so now the gesso is dry on the frame, and it's got a completely crystal white colour, um, and we're going to sand this down to get a marble-like finish to apply our um, bowl and gold leaf to. So I'm going to use a 240 grit Lubrasil sanding paper here um, and I always use an eighth of a sheet so I've torn it in half, torn it in half and torn it in half again and this piece I can fold in half and just comfortably fit three fingers behind it there just to get pressure exactly where I want it and then of course I've got four ways of using that paper and use it there, use it there and there and there. So working right down into all the ridges and when you give the, the whole frame a good sand on all its edges and I need to keep checking the light down it and it's just a matter of practice so it's just a matter of practice and um, seeing when you've got a, a really good finish now you'll notice that we're making a huge amount of dust here and that I'm in a different place. This is actually a purpose-built sanding table which is connected to a, a dust extractor. But good idea to do this outside because uh, this gesso dust is, you know, uh, gets everywhere and it's a very fine dust. Um, okay, so once we've sanded the frame nicely and got it as good as we possibly can, without obviously going back through to wood. Um, but there is another process which we can do now to get it even better, um, which is called water polishing. And what I've got here is some water and about a foot square piece of old cotton sheet, well-worn, well-washed cotton sheet and I'm going to dip half of that in the water. So I dipped half of it in the water. And I'm then going to fold it in half and wring it out together. Now that's to get it sort of evenly wet throughout. And then I'll fold that in half and just keep folding it a couple of times. To get a nice pad to work with. Um, now I'll have to repeat that wetting process every so often because this does take all the moisture out of it quite quickly. But you'll find that if you rub that over the surface, it just takes a little while, then suddenly it'll go and the gesso 
will re-soften and start to form a slurry. And the idea is that you work it to get that slurry into any remaining little pinholes or little dimples or cracks or any little imperfection in the gesso. Um, and that really will leave you with a marble-like surface. Okay, so when I've finished water polishing, it'll take a couple of hours to dry. And again, you know, I wanted to return pretty much to the crystal white um, colouring before the next stage, which is applying bowl. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is make our bowl. And this is bowl, and bowl is a natural clay. But you can see that it comes in a range of colours. And the, the most common ones, the most used ones, are these two here, the red and the yellow. And for perfect gilding, we always give it at least one coat of yellow first. And if you're doing gilding of ornate things and so forth, that's so that, partly, so that um, if you miss any areas, the yellow will help to disguise. It'll simulate the gold in any areas you've missed. But also, yellow bowl has particular characteristics, which it, it flows very well and helps just to give an extra, extra, extra perfect base before putting on the other, um, the other bowls. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one level tablespoonful of that yellow bowl uh, and put it in my pan. I haven't actually got any heat on, but I have had a little bit. The pan is just warm. And again, we don't want to get this hot. Um, just keep it warm, sort of a little above blood temperature, and certainly no hotter than you'd have a bath. And with that, I'm now going to put three parts of my rabbit skin glue size to. So there's three parts of the rabbit skin, the original rabbit skin glue. Remember, I said right at the beginning put some clean rabbit skin glue aside, clean size aside, and that's what it was for. And then I'm just going to put one part of water in here. Um, so that was one part of the bowl, one part of water, and three parts of the original rabbit skin glue size. And now, using a nice stiff string bound fitch, I need to really mix that up and can take a little while to mix this up. Now, when I've mixed it as well as I possibly can, um, if we want to be absolutely sure we're not going to get any lumps, which you might do with the yellow, but certainly with the red, we can filter it through the muslin. And I'm filtering it here through a piece of muslin and into a old soup tureen, which I can then keep warm in a pan of, um, of hot water. So taking that now, and we dusted all the sanding dust off our, our frame and all, uh, water polished it. and get at least one, if not two, good coats of yellow on there. At this stage, we can still use the string bound fitch. Work that first coat in a bit. And then when we've finished this, um, you'll be able to see very clearly when it's completely dry, um, it goes more matte. Um, and you do need to wait until each coat's completely dry before, um, before putting the next coat on. 
So that's now got two coats of yellow vole on it. And at this stage, I might want to give it a very, very uh, light sand. And I'm using here some 1200 grit um, paper, which you get from like a car accessories place or something. And it's just a really take any tiny little bits of living or whatever off the surface, but we're not looking to actually remove anything at all. And now I'm going to give that two coats of the red. So I've got some red in my bain marie here. And remember, we've filtered this to get a really, really smooth bowl. And notice now I'm not using the string bound Fitch anymore. I'm going to use one of my either my sable brush here or a broad watercolour brush so that we get a really even application of the red bowl. And just lay that on. Two coats, making sure we get it in everywhere. Thoroughly dry between coats. So here's the frame now with the two coats of red bowl, minimum two coats of red bowl, and that's completely dry and it's it's gone completely matte, showing that it's it's absolutely dry. What we're going to do now, before we apply the gold leaf, is we're going to burnish this bowl. And burnishing obviously makes it more of a glossy finish, and to do that, we're going to use. 4 wire wool. And it's called 4 which is the grade, and that's four zeros, and it's the finest wire wool or steel wool that you can get. So I'll take a piece of the wire wool and I'm going to rub the frame. Being aware now that I want to try not to touch this surface with my fingers because we don't want any grease which might repel the, the gold at all, the gilding water we're going to use to help the gold adhere. We just don't want any grease marks or anything on, on our surface. So try not to touch it now with your fingers. And you'll see that as I burnish it, not only does it become slightly glossy but it changes color of this as well and in fact if you're using gold in conjunction with colors in your finishing the bowl is really the best way to get those colors so what the burnishing is doing is it's smoothing out the bowl and at the end towards the end of the process we'll burnish the gold itself knowing that underneath the gold we've got a really good smooth burnished surface. I'll keep the wire wool quite fresh so having gone around a couple of sides I'll start a new piece Notice how there's quite a bit of dust coming off or um, particles of the, the wire wool coming off the, um, off the wire wool and we want to make sure that we get rid of all of these before we go ahead, otherwise they will rust into our, our finish. In order to stick the gold onto the frame, we're going to need to make some gilding water. And to do that, we need some of our original rabbit skin glue size that we've put to the side. 
a little bit of methylated spirits, and some warm water. This is kind of quite hot, sort of recently boiled kettle is okay. And I'm going to take a piece of the, the lump, because now it's gone hard, it's been in, in the fridge. I'm going to take a lump about that size, slightly less than a golf ball in size, and I'm going to put that in my jar. And I put literally a splash of methylated spirits in there, maybe something like a cat full. Methylated spirits. And what that does is it breaks the surface tension of the water. It means we're not going to get it sort of sticking and forming a meniscus and that sort of thing. And then I'm going to fill up the jar with the warm water and it's warm going on hot so that it will melt the rabbit skin glue size for us. We'll let it cool a bit before we use it. And there we go. The golf ball of this is right for a large-ish jam jar like that. And we're then going to stir that until there's no lumps of the size left. And as I say, let it cool a little bit before using it. And that's our gilding water. Now that we've completely prepared our frame for gilding, um, we're ready to lay the leaf. And I'm going to introduce you to the tools that we're going to use in laying the gold leaf. So first of all, we've got our gilding water, which we mixed earlier, and we've got a selection of watercolour type brushes, sable or sable mix brushes. We've then got some gold, and what we're going to actually use today is almost pure. It's 23 and a half carat gold leaf. And there is a leaf. And notice how you know, I'm careful moving really slowly with it it'll blow around in the slightest bit of wind and um, you can't touch it with your hands um, it'll just stick to your fingers I've got some other leaves here we can water gild with various types of leaf but they have to be loose leaf that's um, as opposed to transfer leaf which is stuck to a paper backing um, but this is some white gold here which is about 12 carats um, so it's about 12 parts in 24 of gold and it's got nickel and some other stuff in it and gives you a nice bright silver type finish and this is actual silver leaf which is subtly different in the finish it gives and tarnishes quite easy which we can use we can actually artificially tarnish it and get some beautiful finishes with the silver as well but different types of leaves there and here there's an old book that I finished with now You'll notice that these paper leaves, which interleave, um, i.e. go between the, the, leaf, the gold leaves, the red colour comes from something called rosin, which they're covered with. And the rosin is a very fine powder, um, which stops them sticking to the paper or to anything else. Now, make sure that when you finish with some books, you keep a few old books because we can use these bits of paper to rub the rosin onto other things to stop the gold sticking to them as you'll see. This is our gilder's cushion sometimes called a pad and it's a goatskin um, covering over a, over a cushion and we use this to prepare and cut the leaf. It has this parchment backing to stop the wind blowing the gold around, which never behaves itself and stays where you want it to. So I suggest you make something like my little bit of cardboard here and just make something that fits in the back there and keeps the, the windshield up where you want it. This is our Gilder's knife, which is a specialist stainless steel knife, very straight, flat blade. Um, obviously used in conjunction with the cushion. And I've got some Vaseline here, which I use to grease the tips, which is the next bit we come on to. Um, and these are our tips, our Gilder's tips. That's a whole one there. Um, 
and it's made from squirrel hair and very fine row of squirrel hair exactly the same length we use that to pick up the gold as i said that's a whole one but here i've got some that i've cut up a whole one into smaller bits for smaller tasks for more delicate tasks and i've just wrapped the ends with tape to to make sure they stay together this is called a quill you can see because it's got quill on there a um, small brush we use sometimes for just tamping little bits of leaf into place. And also for the same sort of task, uh, this is standard supermarket cotton wool. Um, and I've got a few balls of, of that that I've just scrunched into balls the size of a ping pong ball there. Um, and that's our tools. So as I said, we keep an old book. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to rub carefully. I don't to get my fingers on the bit I'm rubbing too much. I'm going to rub all over our cushion with some of the old book of leaf there, making sure that the leaf isn't going to stick to the cushion. And then I'm going to do the same again with my knife. And I'm going to carefully Give the knife a good old rub with these bits of paper with the rosin on them. Trying to make sure there's absolutely no grease or finger marks or anything else which the gold would stick to on either our knife or our cushion. And now knife in hand or stored in a convenient place where it's going to stay absolutely clean. I'm going to put a leaf onto the cushion. Now, when I open up the book to a particular leaf, if I just let gravity do its thing, well, what happened was one shook itself out from later in the book. So I'm trying to show you that they can sometimes just come out of their own accord fairly easily. But this one, which didn't come out, I'm just going to blow on the corner and blow it into the corner of my cushion. Now when you blow, you must make sure you blow very dry, that you don't spit in anywhere at it. And notice how I've just torn the corner of my book so I can see where I'm up to in the book there. I've torn all the pages off up to where I'm going to go next for my next leaf. And I've put two leaves in my cushion. Now, the next stage is to tease the leaf out so it's flat. And you do this with the knife. And I think it's like having a huge bamboo pole and a bed sheet. This will go all over the place and has a will of its own. Bearing in mind that the gold is only like a couple of molecules thick. So we're really teasing it out very carefully, trying to get it completely flat with the knife. And when we reckon we're ninety percent there, if I blow right in the centre of the leaf, again very dry. You see how it flattens it out, almost completely flat on the cushion. So now once I've got it to that stage, I'm ready to cut the leaf. Now we chose this particular moulding um, for the course, because actually it's quite a difficult one to gild overall. And here is a little piece of it, and hopefully you can see the profile. And the reason it's difficult to gild is if we tried to put a leaf right the way across the whole thing, it would what's called bridge. It would stick there, and it would stick there, and then as it tried to suck itself down onto the gilding water, it would just break all the way along here. And that's called bridging. 
So the way we need to do this is in lays, what they call lays. And we're going to gild this moulding in three different sections, or lays, three different lays. And the first will be from that point just over the domed top, down over the site edge and into the inside of the site edge there. The second will be the large central section of the dome into this groove here. And then finally the back and that bead on the back and over down to the base of the moulding. So what we need to do is we need to estimate how much leaf to use on each lay. And I reckon that the central lay will be half a leaf and each of the others will be about a quarter of a leaf. So what I'm going to show you is splitting our leaf into a half and two quarters. And so now on our cushion, I'm going to first of all lay my knife straight across flat, flat across the leaf at the halfway point, and then in contact with the leaf and the cushion all the way and a reasonable amount of pressure. I'm just going to saw backwards and forwards a few times, carefully lift the knife off, and then repeat for my two quarter leaves there. And I've now cut the leaf in two places, giving me three different bits of gold. Now, in a lot of vi gilding videos and so forth, you might see people rubbing the tips in their hair. Um, and this is called greasing the tip. It's putting a little bit, a very small amount of oils on the uh, s squirrel hairs so that the gold sticks to them but doesn't stick to them too much. And the grease in your hair, um, for some people, does that trick. But I obviously wash my hair for too often because it doesn't work for me. So what I do is I get some Vaseline and I rub some Vaseline into the inside of my forearm. And that amount of Vaseline will now last me, rub it well in, that will now last me for quite a decent session of gilding and having rubbed the Vaseline into my forearm just rub both sides of the tip a few times on there and that should be enough now to pick up the gold so I want to keep the gold in the forward position on my cushion so that the uh, parchment's not in the way and now I'm going to pick up one of the quarter pieces of leaves. And all I do is lay those tips so that a little bit of the gold is hanging over the edge of the tip, but most of the gold is in contact with the, the hairs, the squirrel hairs, and now I can move it to my work. So now we're going to get some of the gilding water and we're not going to flood the surface, but we are going to make sure it is thoroughly wetted with the gilding water. And notice I've started on this back section. So what I want to do is I want to introduce the edge of my leaf just down into that groove. And if I just overhang this a little bit more, and then I'm going to fold it and lay it down the back. But you'll find that the leaf is almost sucked onto the gilding water. So it does come off the tip and onto the surface. And make sure it has time to do so. Don't rush this part of it. So first of all, we introduce it, and then we're just gonna allow it to lay itself down the back. Now, if we have a look at that leaf, it's not perfect. I've managed to bridge a little bit there but I've got it down mainly into the groove there and what I've found is that a quarter leaf isn't quite enough to go right down the back so probably 
um, I want to use a third of a leaf for that. So now let's use the other quarter leaf in the same place. And again, what I tend to do is wet well in front of myself. So I've wet it once already. And what the gilding water's doing, as well as having a bit of a glue, glue in it itself, it's re-softening the glues in the bowl. So we'll lay that one like that. And just allow it to soak down and you can see that. I never tend to get my first one absolutely right. The second one's normally getting into the swing of things and starting to go better. So I've just laid one of the central leaves now so that we can talk about the next bit, which is overlapping the leaves. Now, I brought a couple of samples. One of them is a white gray one, but it just demonstrates the point here. Um, and here on this sample, I don't know if you can see there, there's a very, very thin overlap line where two leaves... Have overlapped each other and that's what will happen if you don't necessarily put more gilding water on top of the earlier leaf whereas if you go quite heavily on top of the earlier leaf then you can get quite exaggerated leaf lays they're called which is where you see effectively a double layer of gold where you've got two bits of gold on um, the frame. Now I wanted just to show you these samples before we go ahead and lay our next leaf. And I've prepared two half leaves on my cushion there and get that ready to go. And I'm going to go for the quite exaggerated leaf lay. And so I'm going to wet well ahead of myself on the... And initially look just up to the leaf. But then just very carefully, just going to get a tiny bit of the gilding water on top of that earlier leaf. And now the way I'm going to lay this leaf is from the outside of the frame in. And that way it won't bridge onto that point and it'll just lay itself neatly across. And now at various stages I can use my cotton wool. This earlier leaf that I laid, you can see a tiny little air bubble has come up in there and formed a bubble in the gold. And I'm just very carefully now Perhaps a few minutes after it was laid, I'm just going to tamp that down. And again, very, very gently, I can tamp down into the groove. And also maybe if there was any bridging across the groove here, I could just use my quill just perhaps to allow the gold to fully get down in there. And we'll keep going back over what we've done and tamping as it dries out, just keep going back over and tamping with the cotton wool to get the leaf down. So again, the next leaf. I'm wet well ahead of myself with the gilding water. Carefully just up to where I left it off on the last leaf. And very carefully, very carefully, a tiny bit of the gilding water on top of that leaf from the inside out allow it time to suck on I'm not careful the tiny bit of bridging there so just push it down into the groove quill and there we go now I'm afraid that's all I can really show you with laying the leaf because I have to say 
it is a case of practice makes perfect and um, you will need a certain amount of practice to get to that stage. Um, however, don't worry too much because one of the beauties of gilded frames is they have, or gilded objects, is that they, the water gilding has a life. And some of the little inconsistencies, some of the little folds in the leaf that will form and so forth, these give it the life that it has. Because if we wanted absolute perfect gold, we'd coat it in brass or we'd spray finish it or something like that. These are all going to add to the life that the finished product has. Okay, so now the we've laid the gold all over the whole frame and I've left it to dry for an hour or two until everything has dried out completely. Remember these little grooves and so forth, the gilding water will gather in there a bit so it'll take longer to dry in there than elsewhere. And now I'm going to use this pony hair mop, very soft mop, um, to just remove all the loose bits of gold. And at the same time, I shall probably expose more little fault areas where it hasn't quite stuck or anything like that. But you can see as I dust off, it's pretty good. And we're just sometimes going into the bristles. So it's scraping, but it is a very soft brush. But we're going around just removing. Now, removing all the loose bits of gold and digging down into that groove all the way and you can see some I've actually left some little bits of faulting are left so that we definitely have something to look at uh, in the first part of the process but I'm going to go right the way around the whole frame doing that with the the, the mop just getting all the loose gold. And if something is going to come off, we want it to come off at this stage so that we can fault it in. So now that I've dusted off all the excess bits of gold and loose bits of gold off the, the, the frame with the pony hair mop, now I'm going to fault in any little bits that I'm not happy with. And you can See, there are some bits of the red bowl still showing and some little bits of bridging and and so forth in our area that we're going to work on. And on my cushion here, on my cushion here, I've um, cut a leaf up into lots of small bits and different shapes and sizes, but basically um, cutting into lots of little pieces in this case sort of one and a half centimeters by half a centimeter and I'm using my smaller tips um, possibly my smallest one because we're just faulting up so let's grease that up with the Vaseline and so I can pick up a little bit there and what I tend to do is work my way around the frame, pick up a bit and find a, a fault that's about the right size for that bit. So uh, let's do a nice obvious one. I just have to move that over fractionally. And I'm going to work on this section here, which my piece will cover. And still with the gilding water, but now I'm using a tiny little pencil brush and I'm quite dry and I'm literally just going to get make sure that the bowl is wetted there and we're not trying to really flood the area in any way just to make sure that the gilding water is on covering the area in question and then I'm going to just lay that down on there and straight away because it's very dry it's quite dry I can tamp that in with my cotton wool straight away and that will not take very long to dry so let's have another go at a, another piece now I wanted to show you something on the cushion here I had a situation there where you see that piece oh, um, that piece has sort of got itself onto my tip and I don't want it on there 
And I'll just show you the trick for when that happens. If I just catch that on the edge of the parchment there, so I should be able to get it to just drop down into the, the cushion again. And um, now I'm going to work on this area here. And again, we don't want any of the gilding water to really show. It will colour the leaf if we have any showing. So we must cover everything where we put the gilding water. Um, otherwise we will get a sort of slightly darker patch on the, on the gold where we had the gilding water. And now I'm going to go right the way around the frame, just faulting. So here's another example of that, that they've come away as one piece. Let's catch that carefully on, on my parchment, and I'll be able to get that from there later. And um, let's go into this little bit on the side here and just work the gilding water in, make sure the area is nicely covered, and I can just lay that over and probably I don't can tamp it just down just to make sure it's nicely stuck on there and um, what I do now is work my way right around the frame getting any little faults and just faulting them in. Now that we've faulted the gold all over the frame we're ready to burnish and we're going to burnish using this agate stone this shape is called a dog's tooth and that's really the most useful one for all different purposes and all different shapes. It's critical that you burnish at the right time. And normally I leave, I gild in the afternoon, fault just before going home in the evening, and then burnish first thing in the morning. And if you burnish too early, you risk the gesso and the bowl still being slightly wet, and it might rip. Um, when you burnish. If you burnish too late, you won't get such a bright burnish. Um, so the way we tell is just by tapping the gold the frame with our agate. And if it makes a nice sharp bright click, like this is doing all over, then it's ready to, to burnish. If it's duller, duller more of a thud when you click it then it's too early to burnish. So I'm going to start here on the high point now and you'll see that as I rub the gold it goes from being a matte gold to being a very bright bright shine and this is what's so beautiful about the water laid finish. Now you can of course leave some sections of the gold in matte. And notice how I use all, all parts of the, the dog's tooth, the agate, to try and access all the little nooks and crannies of the frame. On that side edge there, it's quite good to just hook it in there and then using the point in there, using more of a flat side on there, using the back of it over here, again the point down in the ridge here. And hopefully you can see how we're getting a really beautiful sheen now on the gold. Let's try just changing, changing where we're working and the angle of the light a bit. Work on this section. Now you notice how I tend to hold the agate right up near the stone like this and even sort of use perhaps that finger or my thumb or whatever to rest on a part of the frame because the danger is if you do this um, one little slip and you dig that ferrule into the gold and you just rip straight through into the gesso so you'll be really careful because it's quite easy unless you grip it quite far down it's quite easy to slip so that's what I recommend is hold 
almost holding the stone or holding right up the top of the, the ferrule. So again, I'm just starting work on this high point again. I don't know if the light, if you can see it going. It's quite important to get the lighting right when you're working so you can see the effect that you're having. And as I say, just keep moving the stone around the agate so that you get, get all of the different parts of the, the profile nicely done. So now that we've burnished, um, generally speaking we want to distress the gold a little bit or rub it through so we can see the bowl coming through from underneath and this also helps us see the leaf lays. And most of the time we use the 4-0 wire wool for this. Um, but we could use a, a damp bit of cotton wool, which is much more aggressive. So first of all, I'm just going to show you the 4-0 um, the wire wool. And I'm rubbing quite gently and you have to be careful and again get the light right and it will suddenly go. So I'm going to go quite hard at it this time so you can really see what's happening. And you see the red coming through there and you can see our leaf lays there. And as we work down the frame a little bit, um, you see, and I tend to just work to each leaf layer a little, and as you see it appearing, and obviously as we go around the whole frame, um, we're going to want to sort of get it nice and even. I'm just working really on this middle section, and you can see, see all that coming up like that. So here we are, the finished product, and as you can see, I've gone to town on toning this and made it quite an antique looking frame. And the purpose of going to this extent is to show you how much you can actually do. And really toning is a, a lifetime's work to learn everything about it. Um, but I'm going to show you a few things and show you what I've done here. So, to start with, I've simply used some artist watercolour, sepia watercolour, and I've mixed a little bit of that in with our original rabbit skin glue size mix. And then I've used a flat watercolour brush just to brush a wash of that over the gold. And a couple of coats of that have given us this really dark tone. Sometimes I just use the watercolour as a watercolour wash with just mixed with water and wash that on, let it dry, maybe another coat. But this is more aggressive, mixing it with the rabbit skin glue size, which gives it a bit more body. And that's how we've got that very dark tone there to the gold. And then you'll see on the frame there's a, a grey line I've trailed in a grey line in this groove here and that sort of simulates the build-up of dust and to get that I've used some rotten stone which is this fine abrasive grey powder and again I've mixed some of that in with some of the rabbit skin glue size and just trailed it into that groove a couple of times till I got the build-up that I want. Now another good one for toning is just a, a dark wax like this and you could apply this um, all over the frame and that would give you a quick uh, slightly darker gold, a toned finish and it'll once you buff it up it'll give you a nice wax sheen. But if you just want a clear finish over the gold, so perhaps if you had quite a bright burnish, but you want to finish it just with a wax finish, this microcrystalline wax is the stuff to use for that, uh, which will give you a very nice protection and a very nice sheen without adding um, too much onto the surface of the gold. Anyway, so as I say, toning is a lifetime's work to do everything that you could possibly do with it but there's a few arranger techniques and hopefully you can see what can be achieved with the toning.